wasn't a surprise, but it's still, you know, that's, that's still a, a transition. And then that also means that the high school has a new principal, correct? Because the high school principal becomes the superintendent. So, uh, but it's also that time of year where school teachers are starting to uh, finish the continuing education stuff that they typically spend their year, that spend their summers having to do and having to start turn from, turning from that part of doing their job to the getting ready for the incoming school year that starts far earlier in August than, than anybody really wants it to. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, it's kind of a race between students and teachers, which ones go, can we have to go ahead and start? Uh, you know, that, that kind of thing that goes on. Um, but you definitely, it's, it's definitely not a bad time to be praying for the school district, the school system, the, the teachers and, and folks who are doing some job transitions with that. I don't keep up with all of the uh, personnel and staffing things in, in the school in Cross and Hamburg school districts. Uh, but it's worth noting that there that this is where some of those changes will be taking place and folks learning new, new spaces and, and coming into new spaces and they need your prayers as they make those adjustments and then also students as they start getting ready. Um, and this is going to apply not only to once we're going to go to traditional schooling, uh, but to those that are, uh, you know, that, that are homeschooled. Uh, ours are starting to, well, our one remaining homeschooler is, is starting to, we're, we're, he's starting to, to look at his school year and you know, get ready for, for that. So lots of places when it comes to students and teachers to be in prayer. And then, as is always, seems to always be the case in Arkansas in the summertime, it's way too hot out there. If you, if you or someone you love has to work in the heat, there's a lot of prayer needed for that. You know, this is the time of year that heat kills people. Um, so please be in prayer for, for folks with that, and please be in prayer that folks will be cautious and pay attention. This is also the time of year that one uh, badly misused leftover bottle rocket or poorly extinguished cigarette um, can do a whole lot of damage because it is very dry out there. And you may think that we don't need the grass across the street, and maybe we don't, but there are people that live real close to that grass and, and those, those fires will spread. So. You know, that type of thing we need to be, be in prayer for and be in prayer for folks who just don't have a choice. Um, you know, if your house catches fire tomorrow and it's 100 degrees outside, and it's way too hot to be dressed up in firefighter uniform, guess who's going to come to your house? Firefighters dressed up in, fire, dressed in firefighter uniforms, dealing with all that heat uh, to save your life. So definitely a time to be in prayer for uh, the men and women that do that type of thing. So. Uh, and to be in prayer for a break in the heat and a little bit of rain. Uh, you know, a little bit of rain every couple of hours wouldn't be a bad thing for, for a few days. But, uh, but anyway, so let's go to Lord in prayer together just with those needs, our schools, and then just uh, the weather. And then uh, I'll lead us in Lord in prayer just a minute. So let's pray.
you join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if you take your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 16, we're just going to look at one verse uh, in, in chapter 16. And Tony's going to drag the presentation on over here for us. And we're going to see if the remote control works. If I push the wrong button, the remote control will never work. That's a freebie. That's not the sermon. That's just a little free piece of advice. Um, it's not biblical. Remote controls don't show up in the Bible, but it is true. If you push the wrong button, you don't get what you're looking for. Uh, and realize as we're progressing, what we what we what I have done the past several months and until we we finish up, taking each point of the Baptist faith and message and try to give you a, a sermon, a little bit of, of something in the sermon and some scripture that connects to it. And this week, as we go through in order, this week is supposed to be on evangelism and missions. And th there was a part of me that thought, well, that, me, that lends itself to a great sermon about how important it is that we tell people about Jesus. But I think if you've been here any time in the last six months, you've heard that. Um, and so then I thought, well, you know, it's a good time to preach about missions. But then again, if, if you've been here in the last six months, hopefully you've heard that. Uh, that, that we should go in, into all the world and, and, and tell people about, about Jesus. And, and maybe you need another sermon on that, and, and maybe you don't. Um, but if you do, you get the short one. Folks, we're supposed to tell people about Jesus. And not only that, we're supposed to go not just to the people that we know, the people that we like, or the people that live close by, but to people all around the world to tell them about Jesus. And no, Acts chapter 1 does not give us a, well, first we do Jerusalem and then we do this. That's not instructive. That's just simply reflective of what happened. It's not that, oh, well, once everybody in Ashley County has heard the gospel, then we can think about somebody else elsewhere. That's not a blueprint. This just defines that there are places to go. There are nearby places and there are the uttermost parts of the earth. And we're supposed to be a part of all that. And we're supposed to do that. The other part of the, 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 the article of, in our statement of faith talks about how it's crucial that we do not, by our actions, turn our preaching into some, and teaching people about Jesus into a lie. And that is, we're supposed to behave like our lives have been changed, like Jesus, by Jesus. And, but I'm pretty sure you've heard that in a sermon, too. And if you haven't, folks... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are the fruit of the Spirit. If the Spirit is in your life, that's the fruit that you should see in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus said, people will know we are his disciples by our love for one another. That's in John 17. If you don't love one another, if you don't love your church family members as well as your fellow followers of Jesus at them other places, like First Baptist, if you don't love your fellow followers of Jesus and you don't have any joy, any peace, any patience, any kindness, any faithfulness, any goodness, any self-control at all, then you can claim that you're a follower of Christ, but you're not. Now, you, we all stumble and we all fall short. Nobody does these things perfectly. But somebody that says, oh yes, I'm a Christian, but they won't ever darken the door of any church anywhere, and they won't ever show any love to anybody anywhere, and they don't show any of the fruit of the Spirit, is lying to themselves, they're lying to you, and they're lying to God about whether or not they're a Christian. Now, two of the three of them can be fooled. But let me warn you, the one that matters in that group of three that you're lying to is the Lord God Almighty, and He is not fooled. He is not impressed by your name being on the Vacation Bible School uh, list of people that got saved and baptized after VBS, the list of people that got saved and baptized after youth camp, the list of people that got saved and baptized one more time, just for good measure, after revival. 
He is only impressed with that you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and have committed your life to follow him. Now, again, do we slip up? Yes. Do we get irritated sometimes with our fellow church members? Yes. Do we sometimes get so irritated that we pack off and go to a different church? Yes. Is that always the mature thing to do? No, it's not always the mature thing to do. But if you've got somebody in your life that you're trying to tell about Jesus or you're wondering whether or not you should tell them about Jesus, first of all, if you're not sure whether they're a follower of Jesus, you should tell them about Jesus. I mean, let's just be honest here. Um, and by the way, if they're not sure that you're a follower of Jesus, they should tell you about Jesus. It should be obvious. If you have a friend that you spend time with, on a, if you have somebody you spend time with on an everyday or every week basis, and you don't know the state of their soul, they probably need the Lord. And if they don't know the state of yours, you need to ask yourself where you stand with the Lord, because it should be obvious. Without going too political and getting too far off, off guard from, from where this sermon is going, which is going to Mark 16, 15, I see people fuss and fume and, and worry on Facebook that somehow we're going to make being a Christian illegal in this country. Two things about that. Number one, you can't actually do that. Um, Iran tries it, North Korea tries it. There's still Christians in both of those countries. And number two, the average American Christian wouldn't ever be arrested or convicted for being a Christian anyway because there's not enough evidence in most people's lives that they're followers of Christ. They've never told anybody and they never act like it. So the closest that they come is fussing on Facebook that thus and such a law passed or didn't pass or the, the school district did this or didn't do that. And y'all, that's not being a Christian. Being a Christian is saying, you know what I've realized? Our school teachers are overwhelmed and overrun, and they don't have time to tell people about Jesus while they're trying to do everything else anyway. I'm going to go volunteer or help out or engage somehow to encourage them and build relationships with people so I can tell them about Jesus. Not, I'm going to fly a blimp over, over the, the city and just drop gospel tracts on people. Because they'll know we are Christians by our love for one another. Not by our loud mouth social media posts. Anyway, moving on. Mark 16, 15. As we look at this passage of scripture, and we're just going to pull one verse. Where Jesus says to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation." We're going to draw three things from this, and then we're going to hit some very practical points. Number one is this. Don't get hung up on that word preach. Oftentimes in church, we see this verse, and then we cross-apply it over to the Great Commission. Therefore, go, go ye therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, you know, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then we cross apply this, we say, we take that word preach, and we go, that's your job. We look at Romans 10 and we go, you know, how will they hear unless someone preach it to them? How, as, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of him who gives, who brings good news. We say, preacher, keep your shoes on. We're going to trust that you've got beautiful feet. You go. But this word preach simply means to proclaim or to tell. This is the same word that would have been used in May of 1945 if you were speaking Greek instead of English when you heard the news that Germany had surrendered, or in August of 1945, we heard the news that Japan had surrendered. Whoever knew it, told it. They proclaimed it. They announced it. They preached it. 
This is not a word that indicates that this is the responsibility of one special person in the room. It is not a word that indicates that this is a job that we can hire somebody to do as a church and therefore wash our hands of any responsibility for it. Because we have a habit of that in churches. We like to hire people to do stuff and then we'll never actually touch it. And if you think that's not true, serve, be, be a part of a church that realizes it can no longer afford to employ somebody to do children's ministry or children do youth ministry or to man a nursery or to keep the, the yard mowed and keep the floors vacuumed. But they paid somebody to do it before and try to get the volunteers to make it happen. Because I've been that pastor. Why can't we just hire somebody to do it? Folks, we're not called to come together to hire people to do the work of the church. Now, it is good and right if we can and if we need them to have people who know what they're doing that we can put responsible for things and to compensate them for it. I'm glad we got that, that we're able to, to employ somebody to, to deal with the music. Because I've dealt with the Toronto Island volunteers week after week after week after week to do music in church. And it's exhausting. I'm glad to have a full-time job as a pastor. Because I've done it where I've had a full-time job doing something else and been a pastor. And it's exhausting. But realize that preaching the gospel to all creation is not something that we get to hire out and say, oh, we'll just pay somebody to do that and we'll sit in the pew and watch it happen. This is a command given to all the disciples who are there with Jesus after the resurrection, just like the Great Commission is. Just like Acts 1 is, where he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and, and Samaria and the, the uttermost parts of the earth. It's given to the whole church, and it belongs to the whole church. Churches rise and fall based on whether or not we as the church as a whole Preach the gospel of all creation. Now, does the pastor still do that? Yes, the pastor is still supposed to do that too. But that's like saying that you've decided to run a marathon, but your big toe is the only thing that you're going to work out for. Y'all, all I am is a big toe. I can help us find furniture in the dark. Why God gave you a big toe. But you got to have the whole body involved. Preach the gospel. Go into all the world. That's the second point. All the world. Every corner of the county, every, every, every street of the city, every language group you can find a way to get to. We don't draw barriers between people and the gospel. Go into all the world and go. Not sit idly by and hope that they come. Not spend lots of money buying advertising so that they will then come. There are parts of the Christian faith that work with come and see. After all, some of the apostles, when they first met Jesus, said, what's going on with this? And he said, come and see. But the command that he gives us so often is to go and tell so as you're going, because most of us go, very few of us sit at home all the time and do nothing. You go places. You go to the store. You go to the doctor. You go to the bank. Although it's a little tough at some of the banks because it's hard to share the gospel through the drive through and they won't let you in the lobby. But you go. You go to your kids. You go to your grandkids. You go. You go to your family. You go. You're there to be in the world to preach the gospel. And the third thing from this verse, preach the gospel to all creation. The other aspect we have to think about is the barriers that we put between 
our proclamation of the gospel and people hearing us. Sometimes those barriers are as simple as access. Make a joke about, you know, God gave you a big toe so you can find furniture in the dark. Do we live lives that allow access to people? What if somebody needed to come to church, wanted to come, wanted to hear the gospel, wanted to be a part of the church? But it wasn't just that they needed to turn their hearing aid up. Maybe their hearing aids didn't work at all. Maybe they were deaf. What if they were blind? What if they had mobility challenges? What do we do with that? All creation. Not just the able-bodied. All creation. Not just the ones who only work Monday through Friday and therefore are off every weekend. All creation. Not just the ones, and I don't know quite how this fleshes out, but in all honesty there's some truth to this. Not just the ones who can sit still for an hour and a half and listen to a sermon. But all creation. That being said, what's it look like to preach the gospel? What is the gospel? Well, we're going to break this down. And this comes from something that the North American Mission Board that we're part of, the Southern Baptist, uh, put together. And it, it's a simple way. And so you may want to take notes on this. You may just want to listen. If you want to listen and then you want to go, and then you say, wait a minute, I, I want to remember that. Uh, out there on the back table, there are a stack of these. They're called the Three Circles Life Conversations Guide. It's not quite a track in the sense of, oh, just leave this in place of a tip when you go to Fiesta Linda today. First of all, never do that. Never leave a gospel track in place of a tip. And if you are going to leave a gospel track, you make sure you leave a really generous tip. Even if your food was cold, wrong, and slow. Don't tell them. Don't leave them silver and gold, have I, have I none, but what I have I give you, an eternal life for it. No, they don't want to hear about that Jesus that's unloving and ungenerous. Um, but anyway, but this is kind of, a, it's called a conversation guide, and the idea is that you can walk through it. So the, the first thing that we talk about when we want to talk about the gospel with somebody is that you want to talk about that God has a design that you were made for something. God designed the world to be a world without flaw, without error, without death. That's God's design. God's design for this world was a world where people were able to live in good relationship with each other and in a right relationship with God. That's the design. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Because I read the first three chapters of the book. It's right there. Adam and Eve are used to being able to walk with God in the middle of the day. Oh. You go out there right now and figure out which part of the day is the cool of the day. Look, ridiculous heat shows us that we're not living in God's design. Not only that, but that separation that we feel, that anxiety that we feel, all of these things, those illnesses that we deal with, all of these things are the result of sin's effect on the world. It's not the way God designed you. God's design does not include cancer. It doesn't include dementia. It doesn't include Alzheimer's. It doesn't include you know, broken bones. Or maybe you know, maybe broken bones have been okay because you know Adam and Eve were going to have kids, and kids sometimes mean broken bones. But God's designed none of these illnesses. None of these problems, none of these separations. And his design was good and it was eternal, but the world doesn't feel right, does it? I mean, if that's God's design, does the world feel like we're at God's design? And usually you can start this conversation with somebody 
because you, folks will ask you, does it feel like, you know, just the world just doesn't feel right. All these things that are going wrong. You're right. Don't you wish we had a world where things went right? Where there was no hate. Where there was no anger. Where there was no violence. Because that's the world that God designed. You see, when somebody wants to talk to you about how messed up the world is, they've given you the opportunity to start down this conversation. Because you can tell them what God designed and intended. Okay? So we don't have what God designed and intended. Why? Well, if you, you may not be able to read that because I didn't make the slide myself. Um, North American Vision Board made it, and they have better, you know, they, their projectors are like closer to people. They've got like TVs all the way through the back. But, um, but across that little arrow, there's the word sin. Sin is anything that we do that God wouldn't have us do in a situation. We try to make sin all sorts of complicated. And the reason we try to make sin all sorts of complicated is for this purpose. The more complicated we make it, the easier I can say, well, I didn't really sin, even though I did something wrong. The more complicated the law is, the easier it is to find a loophole in it. This is why the Internal Revenue Code is this thing. The easier it is to find a loophole. But sin is very simple. It's anything that we do that God would not have done or anything that we don't do that God would have done. Then who knows the good he ought to do and does it not for him to sin. It's in the book of James. So it's very simple. You ever been in a situation that you didn't do something that God would have done? That you failed to show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Well, when you put it that way, yes! Sin wrecks God's design. And it doesn't, it doesn't just scratch it, it doesn't, it's not something that'll buff out. It's a wreck. It results in brokenness. Where things are broken. Our relationship with God is broken. Because of sin. Our relationship with other people is broken because of sin. Our relationship with all of creation is broken because of sin. Sin's a big deal. So I don't think my sins were that big a deal. Your sins are a huge deal. Because they separate you from God. And if you're separated from God, you're also separated from other people. Because we are made to relate and interact with one another through the relationship that God gives us. That's that brokenness that you feel. See, the world is designed to be one way, but because of sin, it's broken. And that sounds pretty hopeless. There's good news, which, by the way, is where we get the term gospel from. It comes from the Greek word and the Latin word that mean good news. Okay? Good news was often what was brought by a herald or a preacher or a proclaimer, you know, somebody that perhaps had even gone 500 miles to let them know a good thing that had occurred. Our armies were victorious. Our king has returned. This has happened, that has happened. Well, for us, the gospel that is proclaimed to us is that that brokenness can be healed. That Jesus sent, or that God sent his son, Jesus, the Father sent Jesus to die for our sin. But not only did he die, but he rose up from the grave on the third day. He lives. Salvation to impart. So how do we fix brokenness? We repent and we turn from our sins and we believe the gospel. This is Romans chapter 10. Some of y'all grew up in church. You memorize the Roman, Roman road. That's exactly what that little leg is. Recognize that for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Recognize that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Realize that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
So we repent. We acknowledge that God was right about what we should have done. And we were wrong. Which is why repentance is so hard for us. And it doesn't necessarily get any easier. It involves admitting, I was wrong. I don't like that. Most people don't. Believe and realize that believe here is not simply say something. It's not just a declaration, but it's an actual trust and commitment to act on it. There's actually a lot of debate and discussion about whether or not believe is the best English word, not because it's not about what we believe, but it's about but because we've so watered down the word belief in the modern in our modern times. This is not a belief like you might have a belief that, that Elvis was the best rock, son, rock star ever or a belief that he wasn't. This is a belief that is, I will live or die based off of this that I believe, that I will stand for that. And so belief is one of those words in English that's kind of like the word love. We've, we've kind of watered it down, and so we, we, we sometimes miss it because we use it for a few too many things. This is a belief that involves our wholehearted allegiance to the truth of the gospel. And that drives us then to work to recover and pursue God's design in our lives. See, that's what it looks like. To recover God's design is to say, okay, I'm going to look at scripture and see what it tells me about how I should live instead of living in that brokenness. How I should relate to the people around me. I'm gonna look at scripture and see what how it defines love. Because I know how the world defines love. But I don't look at the word of God and see how God defines love. I know how the world tells me I should raise my children. But I'm gonna look at scripture and see what scripture says about how I should raise my children. I know what the what the world says about how I interact with people who disagree with me or how I should treat people that are my enemies because I know what the world says about that because I like it. Don't get mad, get even. That's what the world tells me. But if I'm going to recover and pursue God's design, I'm going to have to look at the Word of God and see what God's design is. And it's not don't get mad, get even. Get mad, but in your anger, do not sin. It's get mad, but trust that he is the Lord. Vengeance is his. He will repay. It is to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and bring you harm. This is why there's a constant cycle of recovering, pursuing, and repenting again, because we don't always pull off God's design the way we're supposed to. And it's a simple conversation. You can sketch that out on a napkin this afternoon as you go to JB's and get your good cheeseburger and some wings on the side. And you can sketch that out on a napkin. You can pick up one of these conversation guides that has the scripture references in it so that you can point people to those scripture references. It's a simple reminder. I actually have a bracelet that I, I could wear, I have, I don't know where I put my fidget spinner that has it. Y'all remember the fidget spinner craze where you had the oh. woods roam around this thing spin around? It actually had all three circles on it. It was great. And it lit up. Keep your attention. You talk about these things because this is what it is to share the gospel with folks. You say, oh, I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's pretty complicated. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine words. You can do it. You can come right back to the song we sang, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to save us. Very familiar. The song, words of the song are very familiar, even if you don't, even if you've never heard the song before. Because it's the gospel of John 3 16. He gave his one and only son, and whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a tool that you can use to share the gospel with people. This is a tool that you can pick up on, especially with people that you know, 
and people that you know have a church-related background. There's other tools that you can use. We looked at this a little bit for a minute Wednesday night, but this is a Bible story cloth. This is some missionary groups will use this a lot because it starts with explaining that there's one God and works its way all the way through. It goes through 12 little boxes. But you want to start a conversation today while you're at Johnny's. Lay that out on the table and let somebody walk by and say, what in the world is that? You say, well, it's Canadian bacon and pineapple. They say, no, not the pizza, the cloth. You can walk them through the gospel. Do you believe that there's one God? Made us all? That we had a good relationship with? After all, that's God's design. But there's brokenness because there's sin and separation because we fail to follow God's commandments. And the gospel is that there was a sacrifice that Jesus was sent, God's Son, who was the sacrifice for us, who was resurrected on the third day. And so we repent, believe, and follow, and we live like we're a part of the kingdom of God because we're going to recover and pursue God's design. It's right there, too. So what do I want you to do about this? Well, first of all, you need to wrestle with this truth. Where do you fit? What circle are you living in? Are you still living surrounded and, and beset by your brokenness because you've not reached a point that you have repented and believed the gospel? You need to change that. Nobody can do that for you. Parents can't do it for you. Your kids can't do it for you. Deacons can't rub you up, drag you down the aisle, and make you do it. Trust me, we've got some deacons that would if they could. They don't want to see anybody go to hell. But we can't force that. You have to make that choice. Maybe you're living in this spot where you're like, I've repented and believed the gospel, but I'm just... I'm not really, I need to be trying to pursue God's design a little better with my life and recovering what that is. You make that commitment for us today. It may be that you're saying, you know, I'm trying to do this, but I really, I, I, I'm a little bit afraid to tell people about Jesus, and I'm not really sure what to do about it. And I don't want anybody to get offended that I think that they're going to hell. Let me tell you something. Unless you were to look, if somebody's a believer in Jesus, Who's trying to follow Christ, unless you look at them and say, you know what, though? I'm trying to look at who I can pick on by calling out their name. I don't want anybody to get offended. Nora doesn't usually get offended by much. I already picked on her once today, but we'll pick on Billy instead. Um, you know, if, if I were to look at Billy and say, you know, I'm just looking at your life and you're so sinful, it's got to be that you need Jesus, that would be offensive. But if I were to look at him and say, you know, you're my friend, and uh, you know, I love you, I'm glad to talk to you, and, and I don't know where you stand between you and God, because, and see, this is this part's not true, because I do see him in church every Sunday, but I, I, you know, I don't see a church, I don't know if you're a church-going person, I want to share with you what's most important to me in my life, and that's this, I believe God designed us for a relationship with him, and I'd love to, to talk to you about what it means to have one. Now, if he's a follower of Jesus, and he's active at, over at some other church in town, you know, one of the one of the, love, one of the other ones. If I'm lovingly presenting that to him with grace and with mercy and sharing the gospel with him, is he gonna get offended? Probably not. Unless he looks at me and he's like, Doug, do you not remember last week I told you about Jesus? Then he could be like, Are you okay? You're not remembering stuff. Not going to be offended, he's going to be concerned. Somebody's really a follower of Christ, and you share the gospel with them, something that's important to you, and that you want to make sure that they know it too, they're most likely not going to get offended. And you're going to know better that somebody is your brother or your sister in faith. If somebody's going to get offended that you tell them Jesus died for them, they need to know that Jesus died for them. Because they're, they're on that edge of wanting to reject that truth. By the way, if somebody wants to tell you that Jesus died for you, don't get offended by it. 
Share your faith and encourage that person. If it's North Cross at first and they're going door to door, say, great, let me pray for you before you go to my neighbor. Because I tell you, my neighbor, you got next door? Go down on Olive Street. There's one white house on one, on one side of Olive Street. Go, go tell that guy. Don't be afraid. By the way, if the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons come to your house, send them to 135 Olive Street. I'd love to talk to them. <laughs> We enjoy talking to people that have false belief systems. Pleasant. Share the love of Christ with them. Move on with that. But anyway, maybe that's where you are. Maybe you're not sure how to talk to somebody and you're saying, okay, I can see this maybe a little bit, but I'm a little afraid. Well, there's something that was in your bulletin. Everybody got one of these bookmarks. Now, you will notice, and, and if you don't, don't tear it apart yet, because I don't want you to lose it, but you'll notice that, that it's actually two pieces. It has a perforation, and I just tore mine apart. But I, you don't have to tear yours apart yet, but it has a place to write a name. It says, who's your one on there? And this is something that we pushed at Southern Baptist a few years ago, and, and I really like it. Because what I want you to do is I want you to take that, and the name that goes there, that's not where you write your name, okay? Okay. So don't, don't write your name on there. You need to write on there the name of a lost person that you're going to pray for the opportunity to share Jesus with. And the reason it's a bookmark, you can also write the name on a little shorter piece of the bookmark. But what I want you to do is I want you to write the name on there. I want you to keep that in your Bible or in your Sunday school book. And for the next two weeks, I want you to pray every day for the opportunity to share the gospel with that person. And then in two weeks, I want you to bring this back. And I want you to tear it apart then. Bring the card back. Because in two weeks, I want you to bring the card. And we're going to put the cards up here on the remembrance table. And we're going to build a prayer list for us as a church, for lost people that we're praying for. And you say, oh, no, I don't want to put Bob's name on, on a list. Just put Bob. Don't put his last name. Lots of people named Bob. Or you can put just initials. We're not going to read them out. We're not going to give them the dentist to read out over the radio. And Mount Olive Baptist Church is praying for Bob because they think that Bob's lost. We're not going to ask the dentist to do that. But we need to get in front of us the fact that we all know people who need Jesus. And maybe you're not quite ready to sit down with a napkin and sketch out in front of them and ask them the question, where are you on this diagram? Where do you think your life is? But you absolutely, hopefully, you're ready to be praying for them. And then after that couple of weeks, you're going to leave this card. You're going to take this, keep, write the name, same name on there, and we'll talk about what to do with the other half of the, of the bookmark then. So stick it in your Bible, don't lose it. Some of you are going, I'm going to lose it. Your Bible's got bulletins in it from 1972. You're not going to lose the bookmark in there. You know, just put up your daily Bible reading. So that maybe what you need to do is, is to take that. You, know, you need to, I want you to take that. You may need to do some other things too, but you need, we need you to do that. So that we as a church can start praying and our actions will follow our prayers if we actually believe it. Because evangelism and missions is not supposed to just be a segment of a budget. It's not supposed to be something that we talk about. It should be something that we very much believe in as followers of Jesus. Let's pray again. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here. We ask you Lord, to guide us in the coming week. Help us to serve you well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.